talking about quantum and braided ZX calculus. Thanks very much. Um, just to say that I'm getting into this area because I'm on sabbatical, uh, well, theoretically at CQC uh, for six months. Um, and uh, yeah, so, I'll so I've got one paper which is on the archive. That's uh, this one, um, which is what I'll be talking about. Now, part of this is going to the background of this is a theory of hot boundaries and braided categories. I call them braided groups. Admittedly, the name has not caught on, but anyway. Um, uh, which and so there are lots of papers, about sixty papers on this, but um, that I wrote. But um, I would just refer you to if you're interested to this review article. The other bit of background is uh, ZX calculus, uh, of course, which I'm sure everybody here knows. So these are the two particular, probably most relevant. This is a recent one which does ZX calculus in a sort of general case without assuming commutativity. Um, there are lots of other papers to be cited. I, in the paper itself, I cite everything that anybody's ever told me that I should be citing. So many of people in the audience, uh, um, if your, your papers are probably there as well, if, if relevant. Um, if not, let me know. Um, so the uh, topic, the new results are, uh, well, firstly, I'm going to sort of re review this in a more streamlined way that works better in the braided case. The other new ingredient, uh, sort of new result, is is a, a new take. I think it's a new take on Hadam on Hadamard gate uh, as a kind of hot algebra self duality. Uh, then I'll describe the braided version. So that means doing everything in a braided category. Um, and then I think most of the work, in truth, in the paper is is the actually the construction of examples. And so I'm going to do that by a process called transmutation. Now, uh, I don't know if this uh, braided version seriously, I mean, uh, whether we really need braided ZX calculus. I know Mariam in one of her paper with Anhani in their paper mentioned it as a possibility, um, but um, how it would really be used in topological, in quantum, in quantum computing. But I'll, I will give some reasons to believe that this could be relevant to TQFT and, uh, and hence to uh, topological quantum computing. But we'll see. Okay, so the um, let's start the talk. Uh, how do I go on to the next one? Okay. Is that the next one? Um, yeah, so we're going to work in a braided category. Um, the braiding is, um, I'm assuming everybody knows what that is if you don't just shout, um, but you have objects, you have a tensor product, which I'll denote by emission. You've got a braiding, which I'll denote by a braid crossing. It's inverse, I'll denote by crossing the other way. Now, of course, um, um, uh, a hot algebra or a braided group, a hot algebra in a braided category, it just means there's an algebra um, and a co-algebra. I'm going to work in the unscaled, uh, the in the normalized case, uh, where where this where this the co-unit applied to the to the unit is one, um, or the identity morphism from the unit object to the unit object, if you like. Um, so what the, the main axiom here is this one, which says that if you apply the that the co-product behaves multiplicatively, um, is a map from B, the braided hot algebra with a product, uh, is an algebra map. From B to two copy to B tensor B with this tensor product algebra structure. So that's what it means. The uh, the antipode is a kind of inversion which obeys this these identities here. Now, um, of course, it, the idea was to do Hopf algebra theory in a diagrammatic language. Um, the first thing that I I think the, one of the most important things that I did early on was this lemma here. This says that if you apply the product and then apply the antipode, it's the same thing as applying the antipode separately, but then reversing using the braiding um, like this. Now, you can, also the same thing is true upside down for the co-algebra. Now, here's the proof. Um, so this is, yeah, so this is, uh, um, I mean, I, th I think in those days it was, it was somewhat novel, but now I think you could probably figure this out yourself. Um, but uh, you, so we, we, we take this thing, we insert these trivial loops. So this is going to be trivial according to this axiom. So that's going to be trivial. So then that's just the same. It doesn't change anything. So then that outer loop is also trivial. So that is the same as that. Um, because that will just collapse to one, which would be pruned off uh, here. Then uh, now, I'm, now I'm going to sort of swing this around using functoriality like that. 
then I'm going to reorganize the using co-associativity to reorganize the tree and associativity to reorganize the branches like this. Um, and, uh, and now I'm going to use the hop algebra axiom to the bioalgebra axiom to recognize that as that. Now I've got a loop which I can cancel and I get the answer. And then you can turn it upside down for the, for the, for the dual. Okay, now this, ad, this antipode is really uh, important. For example, you use it in constructing the adjoint action. So the adjoint action of any hop algebra on itself is you split with the coproduct and then you put on, and then you uh, multiply on either side, you kind of conjugate uh, using the antipode um, but, and the thing that you're acting on goes in the middle. So that's the diagram for it. And this, uh, this, this checks that, that you have an action. So if you apply it once and you apply it again, then uh, you get the same thing as applying, as applying the product and then applying that product using the adjoint action. So that means it's truly an action. And this says that it respects product. So if I multiply something and then I apply the adjoint action, it's the same as splitting in half with the coproduct in, into two and then applying one, one leg um, to the product, to one, to one of the elements, the other leg to the other, and then applying the product. So that's what's called a module algebra or a braided module algebra in this case. Now, uh, I'm not going to tell you all the theory, a lot of the theory here. I'm just going to tell you one theorem, uh, well, a couple of theorems. Um, so the theorem I want to talk about transmutation comes out of tanaka Klein reconstruction. So the theorem is that the, the, the sort of underlying theorem is if you have a monoidal functor between a monoidal category and a braided category, and the braided category should have duals, um, and there are certain representability, uh, so you should be able to be able to co-complete it, or, or at least represent a particular functor, a certain functor that we're interested in. I won't go into all the details. Then you obtain a, a braided Hopf algebra, um, which I call ORTF as a certain co-end. This indicates a co-end. But abstractly, it's the universal object, ORTF is the universal object which makes this diagram commute. So such that the functor you began with factors through the modules in the category of this Hopf algebra in the category via the forgetful functor. So that this is the abstract definition. Now, if you take F to be the identity, uh, then what it means is, is that every model braided category has within itself, maybe in a co-completion of it, um, has a, a braided hot algebra. Uh, and this has lots of very special properties. For example, it's braided commutative in this sense, co-commutative. So this says that, uh, so this double twist wouldn't be the identity, but if it was, then this would be saying that this was effectively co-commutative because it would be saying that the flip on the coproduct is the same as not applying the flip. Um, but here we sort of test it against every object in the category. And that has enormous consequences. Another consequence is that this carries an action of PSL2Z, which is the mapping class group of the torus. And that means that is central to the role of these categories in constructing uh, three manifold invariants. I won't say much about that. Uh, but Sorry, can I, can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Uh, you have all these wires splitting up into multiple wires. What's going on there? Like, what is that? Oh, I thought everybody knew the diagrammatic, diagrammatic notation. Um, okay, uh, let's back up. Um, so I'm reading diagrams down the page. Thank you for, for asking this. I'm reading the diagrams down the page. I'm writing a product as, so, so from B tends to B to B, I'm, go, I'm writing it down like that. So this is just the algebra product flowing down the page. And um, in a hot algebra, you, or a bioalgebra, you have both a product, which is a bit like this, and you have something which un, which is, goes the opposite way. So it goes from B into B tensor B, and that I'm denoting by this splitting. I think uh, John's question is more like on the next page, you have oh, labeled branching things. Like the oh, 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 okay. Um, yeah, exactly. That's the question. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Um, no, they just, you see, because in those days, we didn't have red and green, etc., because there was just only one type of node this way and one type of node that way. So I just I only just labeled, I colorized these ones for your benefit, but in the original papers, there's no colors at all. So it's just that all, all these branches are all green and all these, all these, all these joining branches are all red. That, that answer your question? Um, so yeah, yeah, in, in, if you were doing it now, you would color it, you would put nodes in everywhere. I just, there's no need because there's only one type of object. Um, so there's only one algebra and only one color algebra in the picture. Okay, but I have tried to colorize them for your benefit. I just got lazy uh, on those. Okay, um, 
Now, can I uh, ask a follow or a really question? Um, what's the triangle on that slide on the bottom? Diagram? I was just to know it's an action. So when a hot valve, when whenever something acts on something else, I'm going to note it by this triangle. So what this says is is that when the so this is this is, so in this diagram here, any any object original category, um, well here C and D are the same. Any object X um, becomes also a module over over the automorphism uh, braided hop algebra, and so that means. That means the braided automorphism braided hot valve, which I'm splitting here, that acts on X. And this action is denoted by the triangle. Okay. Um, so it, it just says that it, it's co-commutative as visible with respect to anything it acts on, uh, with respect to the action on this on, on all the objects that automatically come from, from objects in the original category. They all the objects in the original category become modules of of of, of ORT C by this by this diagram, and they're all co-commutative in some sense with respect to the co-product. What are the properties of that category of modules? Uh, it has lots of nice properties. So it's another it's another it's another monoidal category. I'll, in fact, I'll come to that on the next page. So it's it's a beautiful theory. There's a lot, I, I don't want to spend the entire seminar talking about it. So, but there's about there are, there are you know dozens of papers on this. So I'll I'll be happy to say a lot more uh, uh, maybe. Uh, after at the end of the talk, if I have time, but I just wanted to, to to show you very quickly one application, which is what I will need in the talk today. Um, so, if you apply that to to the case where the category is is H modules, uh, where H is itself a quasi triangular hop algebra in the sense of Drinfeld, so these guys generate uh, their mo category modules are braided. That's basically the definition. Um, then, according to this, we will get a, a braided hop algebra, which I call B of H, in the same category. And what does it look like? Well, as an object, it's it's a, it's a, an object in the category where H acts on itself by the quantum adjoint action. So that's what I showed you before, but now in, in vector spaces, it's the adjoint action in the usual category of vector spaces. Um, H as an algebra, B of H is the same as H as an algebra, but the coproduct is modified. Now, um, I'm gonna denote the coproducts by just one and two. There's a kind of sum implicit. And I'm gonna denote R is the quantity triangular structure also denoted by R1 and R2. And here is the adjoint action. I put a little label underneath it to remind you it's the adjoint action. Um, so there are two specific formulas for all these. Now, that, so that's that's these are the uh, sort of a large class of examples of braided hop algebras. Now, going the other way, there there are many others like quantum planes. Uh, you know, uh, all kinds of things are, are braided hop algebras these days. Um, another another uh, theorem in the other direction, which I call bosonization, is if you are given a um, a hop algebra in this in this category. Um, so given a, a hop algebra B in this category, then you can turn it into an ordinary hop algebra because B is as an, because the algebra and the algebra live in the category, that means they are covariant under H. Therefore, you can make a semi-direct product. And the result is that you will get uh, by, as an algebra and a semi-direct coproduct as a co-algebra. And the theorem is that you will get another hop algebra. Um, and this would be characterized as the, the braided as the ordinary modules of this ordinary hop algebra is equivalent to the braided modules of B in the braided category. Okay, so in the case of B of H, that's the, that's exactly what you just asked about, Miriam. Um, okay, so now the other thing is is that uh, in the case when H is factorizable, this uh, B of H, this this bosonization, you can take B, take H, you can take it's a braided version, B of H, and then you can bosonize it and get another ordinary Hopf algebra. And what you'll get actually get is the quantum double. So that's a different way of thinking about the quantum double. Okay. So now I, I, I will need to stick to, um, so there's a lot more as I said to that theory, but I just want to, uh, foc I will try to focus on, um, well, no, I mean, I just should, I should have mentioned something here. Um, if you want to read more about this theory, then chapter 10 of this book is all about braided hop algebras and large chapters of this book are all about braided hop algebras. So you can read as well as this review article. Um, you're welcome to read in there. And by all means, ask me any questions you, you may have if you're interested in, in reading more about these. Okay, um, that's all for the generalities. Now the topic in hand is, uh, is, uh, ZX, is uh, ZX calculus. So the sort of algebraic structure underlying it as far as I understand, and I'm no expert, um, is this notion of a Frobenius uh, Hopf algebra. So, and I, I'm I, again, I'm sure that everybody here knows what this is. So I'll just I'll just remind you quickly to establish the notations. So we're going to have a red Frobenius algebra. So this is an algebra and a co-algebra denoted um, with this identity. 
And as you, as many, most of you, if not all of you will know, you can extract from this a, a pairing, um, uh, an, a, 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 um, an evaluation and a co-evaluation obeying the snake identity. And then you can realize that the one of these as the dual of the other. Now, the same thing will be true for a second copy, the green copy. And uh, what you can ask, and this is something that Ross did, uh, particularly did in some generality, one of his papers, um, is for the two to be, uh, the two, if, if suppose that these two fit, fit together to form a hot algebra, the red and product and the green co-product, and, and at the same time, the other way around also fits together to form a hot algebra. Uh, so then we'll call that a Frobenius hot algebra or F hot algebra for short. And uh, also interested in the special case of so for being algebra to be special, we require this. Now, um, so the first result of the paper uh, is sort of, it's, it's a somewhat, I mean, I don't think it's too surprising probably to those who have really gotten into it, but it's not, I, but I try to lay it out in a cleaner way. So the way I've laid it out is the following, that if you have uh, any hot algebra at all to begin with, at the moment, we're just going to work in symmetric categories, so you can ignore any braid crossings, uh, let's say, in vector spaces. Uh, if you are given a hot algebra H, um, and if the antipode has a special form, so this is the only assumption, that the antipode has a special form and that the algebra and the co-algebra are both Frobenius separately, um, then, um, then this H tilde is automatically a hot algebra. Uh, and is, first it's a bi-algebra, which is not trivial, and then it's, and then it's also a hot algebra. And it's, and it's antipode looks like that. And moreover, this other hot algebra in the pair is actually um, the, the dual, well, the opposite of the dual. So, okay, so this is, uh, and I'll just show you. Now, I'm going to lay out the proof in a way that generalizes to the braided case. So you can ignore the braid crossings, but I'll remind you about them later. So we've got so we, so this is going to be the reverse the the H tilde the reverse top algebra where we take the the um, the product the green product and the red co product and now these can each be dualized so that's I've just written in terms of 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 the uh, the other ones so I've just done that now I recognize um, I can I can recognize that what I've got here is um, is the um, here is actually the S inverse. So I put that in there. Um, but now I can take this S inverse through using the fact that it's anti-multiplicative. So I can write it like that. Um, and, uh, and now this S inverse cancels with the red to give me a green. So I get that. And, um, so, so, uh, and here I use the bi-algebra axiom. So I have that. So that's one side. Now I'm going to start on the other half. I want these two to be equal. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to look at this. Uh, but I'm going to take it with the wrong braid crossing, which of course is not relevant at the moment. Um, now, again, I will dualize them. So in terms of their dual structures. Um, now I'm going to, I, I can re again recognize a bunch of times where S occurs in these, in these bends when I've got a, a green and a red. Um, so I've actually got this. And now um, I'm going to, uh, I will just reorganize it a bit using punctoriality. Um, and then I'm going to drag the S's through, these S's through, and these S's through, using again the braided, braided anti-multiplicativity property with respect to the uh, product now. And so I have that. And then if I drag this over to the other side, I will have the same as that. So these are equal. So that's the proof that we do have a, a, a that H tilde, where I take the other halves of the Frobenius structures that does in fact form a hot algebra. Uh, well, a bi algebra. Um, this is the proposed antipode. If I put that in, um, then it reduces to an antipode loop for the original hot algebra. Okay. The last thing is to check that is to see how this the dual hot algebra is related to this this other hot algebra in the pair. And so I'm going to show that. H tilde is in fact, um, uh, we're going to just compute these. This is the adjoint, I'm going to take H and I'm going to compute its adjoint with respect to the red duality pairing. So that means that it's, uh, um, it's 
product will just be the adjoint of the of the code, red code product would just be the red product. But I've also got to take the adjoint of, of the green code product and the adjoint of the antipode. So, um, so I, I'll just focus on this. So the the adjoint with respect to the red product of the green code product is this. I'm going to insert this, which does nothing. Um, but now I recognize that I've got S and S inverse, so I've got this. Now I'll use the anti-multiplicativity property of the antipode, this, this lemma, I told you it was the key lemma. Um, and so I'll, I'll have this, and then I just reorganize it a bit. Well, I sort of pull this up and I get this, um, and then I recognize the answer. So what, so what I recognize is that I have the opposite product of the, of the product of the other, pro of the green product, I have the opposite of the green product. Okay, so what we learn is is that the in the Fabian, so what we learn is is that every Hopf algebra H, assuming that it's Frobenius and and on on both sides, um, will automatically amplify to an interacting Hopf algebra pair, but the other half of the pair is is actually H star opposite. Okay, now the other question is is when are Hopf algebras Frobenius? And that was looked at, that's actually known from per, work of Paregis in the 70s, but that was all woven into the theory in this paper of Collins and Duncan, um, which I cited. So, um, so this is known, but again, I'm just giving a, a, a slightly different take on it. Um, so if H is finite dimensional hot algebra in VEC, then there do exist a Frobenius structure on the algebra and co-algebra meeting the conditions in the proposition. So everything works. And uh, just to remind you of what Paregis did. Um, if you have an integral, so an integral on a Hopf algebra means a linear map, uh, which is translation covariant. So if you think of the co-product as, as like a group um, co-action, uh, it doesn't mean anything to you, don't, don't worry about it, but this is, this is the analog of a Haar, of a Haar integral. Uh, there's a bit of, just a bit of junk there to signal that. Um, the, um, the, that's an integral on a Hopf algebra. Uh, we also have an integral element in a Hopf algebra, lab, capital lambda, which is characterized by this, that if you multiply by H, it acts by the co-unit. And this actually is the dual of this statement. So that's the same statement on the dual side. Um, now, what you can do is, is you can define the bilinear uh, product by multiplying in the algebra and then applying the integral. And you can define its dual, its, uh, its co-evaluation, by applying the co-product to, to, to lambda and then applying the antipode on one side. And then you can check that it is in fact a Frobenius structure. And similarly, by swapping the roles of capital lambda and the integral, um, you'll also have, have on, on the green side. And then if you compare these constructions very carefully, you'll see that in fact, the antipode is exactly of the form we wanted. Because you see this, this green product, well, let's say, let's look at this one. This, um, this red thing, uh, uh, cap, and the green, um, well, I don't know, let's see. Let, let us, let's remind ourselves what the antipode was. The antipode was the green, the green, the green cup and the red cap. So the green cup and then the red, uh, the green cup and the red cap. Okay. Um, well, I'm not sure this is. I'm not sure this is. Uh, um, very easy to see, but in any case, it's it's uh, it's it is it is explained in the paper a bit more carefully. But you'll find that it is of the right form. Let's just gloss over that, um, if I may. Um, so I want to give you an example. Uh, so the um, I'm going to look at quantum group eight UQSL two at Q to the Q of primitive nth root of unity. So this is generated by uh, three generators E, F, and K. They're all well, e to the n, k to, uh, f to the n are zero, and k to the n is one. They obey these commutation relations, and this one is meant to be like the quantum, the SL2 Lie algebra, if you know what that is. So these are kind of exponential version. If you replace k, think of k as e to the Cartan generator of SL2. This is like the SL2 relations. This is the co-product. Um, this is the antipode, and this is the drinfeld quantity triangular structure. Uh, all of this actually works when Q is minus one. There are different conventions for this. I've chosen conventions very, in a very special way so that they actually make sense when Q is minus one, except that we should just leave out these factors. 
which amounts to a different normalization of E relative to F. You can just absorb the factor in, in E and then not write it in the equations. Uh, and then it works also when Q is minus one. Now, the, um, the integrals, um, so I, I should have mentioned this, but it's been known from work of Larson and Swedler that all five dimensional hop algebras have unique integrals up to normalization. So that, so, um, so that was why that, that corollary worked. Um, and uh, the integral here, when you work it out, it looks like this. So it has support in the top degree for E and F and in degree one for K. Uh, lambda is sort of, is similar. It has just the top degree elements and it has this element here, which is the sum over all the Ks. And then going, following the construction then, um, we will use these to construct the, the, the Frobenius structure. And then from the Frobenius structure, we'll dualize the red product to get a red coproduct. And we'll dualize the green, so the, the green coproduct to get the red product. So the input data was red, red product, green coproduct. The output data will be the, the associated Hopf algebra where I've reversed the colors. And they'll be given by these formulas. And, and uh, this must be isomorphic to the opposite of the dual. So that means it must be isomorphic to a quantum group CQSL2, which is also known. Um, but it actually gives a very nice new, new way of, of working with that quantum group. So it's actually quite useful even in algebra. Okay, so that, that was meant to be the, uh, the kind of the straightforward part, um, reviewing a, a, what, what's already known in a, in a, in a, maybe in a cleaner way. Now, um, the Hadamard, I want to talk in this context of uh, st still working in vector spaces, if you want. Uh, I'm going to just talk about Hadamard gates. Um, so now I'm going to define this in terms of something I call a Hadamard form, which for me will just be a non-degenerate bilinear form on H. Uh, there'll be an associated gate, which I will write like this. It's just basically viewing, the, uh, viewing this bilinear form as a map. By evaluation against it, so uh, rather by well by this by this using the co value the red co evaluation. Now, in the case where the the Frobenius structure the, the evaluation is and co evaluation are given by an integral, then this h its inverse looks like this here theta one tensor theta two is is this thing but view the other way as an element of h tensor h, and uh, so so that um, if you if you stick in the definition of the of, of the inner product, that's just the integral. So um, so this actually this actually plays this is actually a Fourier transform. This uh, theta one tensor theta two plays the role of the exponential map, if you want, and we integrate a function against it, and that so that's Fourier transform. Technically, it's the canonical Hopf algebra Fourier transform composed with the inverse of this guy regarded as a map. From so this f is from h to h star, and then I regard this. Um, as a map from H to H star, uh, and then the inverse is a map from H star to H, and I compose it, and that gives me a map from H to H. So this uh, this this Hadamard gate is set up to be um, basically Fourier transform, which you think is the important part is up to you. This guy is actually trivial; it's just the kind of tautology, so it's canonical. And for me, the input is really in theta, but you could sort of think of theta as somewhat. Um, given in some context, and then the input you could think of as Fourier transform. Okay, now I'm gonna start with what is, I think everybody here probably thinks is the obvious definition. Um, so if you, so I'm going to require of theta, so far I haven't put any conditions on theta apart from being non-degenerate. I'm going to require that theta, the adjoint with respect to theta of the red gives you the green. And so in diagrammatic terms, this looks like this. So that's actually an identity. It says that theta is a kind of bi-character with respect to the product on one side and the co-product on the other side. And what that then translates into is that this H as a gate um, conjugates, conjugation by H turns red into green, okay? So that's kind of thing that you might like. It obviously a usual, in the usual Hadamard gate, H squared is the identity. So there's no difference between H and H inverse, but otherwise this is what you would expect. Um, and so the example would be ZM. Could I ask a question? Yeah, of course. Um, the fact that you have an inverse, is that immediate from that the, the, you're requiring it to be non-degenerate? Yes. Yes. yes, yes, 
it's because everything is finite dimensional, just being non-degenerate, even on one side is enough, is the same thing as being invertible. Because the map would then, if it, because the map being non-degenerate would mean it was injective when viewed as a map. And then that, because it's finite dimensional, that would also mean it's subjective. Okay, so now we're really thinking about concrete finite dimensional algebras and not like abstract symmetric mm -hmm. monoidal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's best to, I, I'm, I'm, I'm doing diagrams because I know that people in this audience like diagrams, but this is just ordinary vector spaces. But then in the second half of the talk, I will, we will be in a greater category, but everything will be k-linear and all the objects will be built on high dimensional vector spaces. So if, yeah, if you want to say this more abstractly, you have to be a bit more careful, <laughs> right? That's what you're saying, right? You can, you can say this more carefully in any, in any um, monoidal category with appropriate duals. Okay, so thanks. Yeah. Um, so the um, uh, so the example that you probably would like, but it's more non-trivial than than you think, um, is is K, is H is the group algebra of Z n. So they're just labeled by I from I is I is 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 uh, integers mod n, and so there's a canonical bilinear form on on this, which is this theta, and the co-product of the group algebra. So the group algebra is just labeled by states with. Uh, with um, the product being addition mod n, um, and the co-product is just group-like. Um, and this property here, which is obvious for exponentials, that is exactly this identity here. But the other identity is actually quite a bit more non-trivial. So there you've got to look at the red co-product and the green product. So the red co-product, this, this looks like this. This is the co-product of the dual hop algebra. And, um, uh, and then the identity we want is this one. So that translates into this. I applied, this is this side here. Um, and that when you put in the definition is this, which is this, which when you do the sum gives you this. And so that gives us the answer using the fact that the, re that the green product is actually that they're projectors. So the product of J with K is Delta J K times J. So this all works, but it's a bit non-trivial. Um, and, and you get, uh, uh, you get the thing, but you're actually, you, you can't avoid that you get an extra n here. So actually, this is what I would call quasi Hadamard. It works up to a scale factor n. So uh, what's Q again? Uh, Q is, uh, is, I have I've kept the definition from a different example. That was very naughty of me. Q is a primitive nth root of unity. So Q is e to okay. the 2 pi i over n throughout the talk. Thank you. Okay. Um, and then H, H from the definition I gave you is this, which just works out as Fourier transform. So this is what you would expect for Zn, um, but um, okay. But now I want to point out this is a bit unnatural. Why is this unnatural? Because these are going in opposite directions. So it's rather unlikely that a map that usually, if you have an adjoint going one way, then you're going to want the inverse to take the ad to adjoint the other way. So you aren't likely to have very many examples of this. I think this is just like a rare exception. I haven't been able to find any other examples. Um, so what I think is more natural is what I call a type two Hadamard structure, where we just swap the swap B over a bit. So instead of, so instead, I just swap the red and the green here. And so then the identity looks like this, where I've swapped the red and the green. Um, but now the price we pay for that is that, um, is that now it's a bit more awkward. If I want to compose these maps, the H's don't cancel with the H inverses. So it doesn't cleanly take the red spiders to the green spiders, et cetera. So it's a bit more awkward to work with, but presumably they would have, you would have some control over powers of H. So it's a bit like working with, uh, with general Frobenius hop algebras where you can't get rid of the bubble. Um, it's a bit like that. And it may be related to that. Um, so, but, but the advantage is, is this is a very natural definition. And actually, this identity, these identities here are equivalent to saying that this map of sending H, viewing theta as a map, what we discussed, as a map from H to H star, um, actually is an isomorphism of Hopf algebra. So it's exactly saying that you have that your Hopf algebra is self-dual. So this Hadamard structure exists if and of type two exists if and only if Hopf algebra is self-dual. Um, if you don't like the appearance of the opposite product here, which you probably don't, and you want to land exactly on the green product on the nose, not its opposite, then you will need to change this, uh, this bilinear form on this half by, by some variant, and then it will work. And that will be exactly equivalent to H uh, as a map, uh, to theta as a map, being an isomorphism, an anti-self-dual um, out Hopf algebra isomorphism. So it's, it's saying exactly that the Hopf algebra is anti-self-dual. 
uh, which again, I think is fairly natural. I don't think it's been studied in the literature at all, but I, I would think it's also fairly natural. Okay, just give you some examples. Um, the, um, the, of type two, well, I mean, Zn can be viewed as type two if you want. Uh, it's much trivial, much more trivial, but then it's just the bi-character properties. We don't have that, that difficult identity at all. Um, the, another example would be UQSL2 at Q equals minus one. That happens to be self-dual. So that's a certain uh, eight-dimensional Hopf algebra. And you work out the Hadamard gate. It's in, it's in the paper. And it looks like, looks like this. So, uh, I mean, well, it is what it is, but it's a certain eight by eight matrix. So it's quite concrete. Um, if you want a general construction, then you can take the UQB plus, which is just the subalgebra generated by F and K inside UQSL2. Uh, so that's also called the Taft algebra. So um, I've written it out here, what you get for N equals three, but it works the same way in general. So um, it, it basically, um, I define these delta i's as like the Fourier transform of the k's. If you were working in the group algebra of Zn, then these would be delta functions on Zn. So this, this h looks like Fourier transform, but it gets shifted according to the powers of f. So this one is basically Fourier transform, but it also takes the zeroth power to the top power. And then here it takes the first power to the top minus one power, etc., uh, and gets a factor q. Um, so, so it's a kind of it's reminiscent of Fourier transform, but it just looks different. It's just different. So, so that's, this works. So, this, so the moral here is, is that type one is the more obvious one that you that works best for spiders and diagrammatic calculus, but it's, I don't think it's very natural, and I don't think there are many examples. Um, although now I've laid it out clearly, what you're looking for, one can certainly see. Um, the uh, type two is, I think, very natural. There are lots of examples of self dual hot algebras. Um, type three hasn't really been studied, but I think there are also lots of examples of those. Okay, so that's my take on Hadamard gates. So that that completes sort of my understanding of what I think what what people have told me, uh, and I'm not the expert here, are the main ingredients of ZX calculus from a kind of abstract point of view of generalizing Z two by another hot algebra. Um, okay, so I'd be you know happy for people who know much more about this than me to tell me what to look at next. But these are what I think are the most important. Okay, so now let's look at the braided version. Now, because I did all my proofs very very carefully, I don't have any work to do. Um, if you go back to what we actually proved, um, what we actually proved in the main proposition um, was this proof here, and I just took the wrong braid crossing here. But otherwise, everything worked. I did made no other assumptions about braid crossings. They had no other wrong braid crossings. So what that means is, is that, um, uh, is that we have, we have this corollary that if B is a braided Hopf algebra now, so now we're working in a braided monoidal category. Um, and if the antipode has the special form, um, and if the algebra and the co-algebra are both Frobenius, then, the 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 um the associated one where we swap the red and the green is again a bialgebra but in the category with reverse braiding right because we had the wrong braiding so there's another braided category where you swap all the braidings and uh, it's in that category and the antipode lives there okay alternatively if you really want to stay in your original category c which after all we do then what you have to realize is that the right object to consider um is actually the thing which is actually Hopf algebra in C uh, is its opposite. So if B is a Hopf algebra in, in, in the opposite category, then B opposite with the opposite product is automatically a Hopf algebra in C. That's a, a well known fact about braided Hopf algebras. So in our case, it means that this is the braided Hopf, is, is a braided Hopf algebra in our original category. So the moral is, is the right object to look at is not really just swapping the red and the green, but it's also swapping, it's also reversing the product if you want to stay in the same category. Now, the other complication with regard to that corollary um, about the Frobenius structure is that braided groups, well, what the integral is not gonna be a morphism from K from B into something like a trivial object, but it isn't, but usually it's, I mean, there is a theory of, of, of I mean, most braided Hopf algebras do have an integral, but the integral does not usually map to the unit object of the category. It maps into some other one dimensional object, but it doesn't have to have, be the trivial one. Um, and so there is some kind of charge, if you like, associated with, with, with the value of the integral. 
And that means you can't pull it through grade crossings. And similarly, the integral element, you can view it as a morphism if you want, but it isn't a morphism from the unit object. It'll usually be some other object in the category. There'll be some other object which still behaves well with respect to tensor products, but, uh, but not the unit one. Okay, um, so now, however, in the class of ones that come from factorization, from, from book transmutation, so if you remember that transmutation construction, given a hop algebra, a quantity triangular hop algebra in the sense of Drinfeld, and I'm going to assume something called factorizability, which I will explain what that is later on as a technical condition. Um, then B, um, the, the transmutation B of H, firstly is self-dual as a braided hop algebra. So that means it automatically has a Hadamard form. Um, and B, uh, if the under reasonable conditions, namely lambda should be unimodular. So it's a, both a left integral and also a right integral in the original hop algebra. And that is true for all UQGs. So UQGs are unimodular on the algebra side. Um, if you like, the condition is, is that the antipode applied to lambda should be lambda. Now, if that's the case, then you can check that that means that lambda is invariant under the adjoint action. And that then implies that we have a morphism from the trivial object of the category. One is the trivial object. Similarly, if the, and then it also implies that the integral, now the integral, the same element lambda can be viewed as an integral on the dual Hopf algebra. So that's now going to be a morphism. Now, because of this, now the, I haven't told you, I skipped a lot of stuff here, but H star is a co-quasi triangular Hopf algebra. It therefore has another abraded version by a dual of that construction I showed you. The construction I showed you was factoring through the modules of the automorphism Hopf algebra, but now we're going to factor through the co-modules of the automorphism Hopf algebra. That's the dual construction. And that gives you another braided Hopf algebra, which I'm going to call B star of H star in this case. And, um, and, that, so, and that, but that turns out to be exactly the same thing as B star. So what we get is a map from B star and then because of the add invariance to one. And so, and so that, so now, but then because of the isomorphism, we can view it as an integral from B to one. So in this way, in this convoluted way, we end up with an integral element in B and an integral on B, which are both morphisms. Okay, and that's, so that's in some generality for this construction. Uh, so, so each transmutation example uh, has um, has a, has a good braided integral. Um, the braided version of our construction with VEC now works. That corollary that we had, um, the, the construction of the, the construction of the Frobenius form from the integrals. All right, that's that we did it in VEC, but here I, here I've spelled it out in the braided category. So here I'm checking that this is the Frobenius. Uh, red, the red Frobenius evaluation. This is the red Frobenius co-evaluation. Okay, and um, and I'm checking that they obey the snake identity. So that all of that should collapse to, to the identity. So you go through it all. I'm not going to read through it now because I run out of time. Uh, but what you get is this, and you can't cancel. You can't take that through and and and, and remove it if these are not morphisms, but in our case, they are now morphisms, so we can. So everything works, this is on the other side. Okay, um, just going back to what I'm talking about here is this corollary. Uh, if you did want to check that it obeys the identities that we want, um, what you have to check is, is that the, the, the red, this with the, with the green cap, um, okay, uh, obeys the um, obeys the uh, obeys s, okay. Uh, give, gives you back s. That was the property we wanted. So if you take this with this, but with the, with an s there, we want we want to get s. So that's exactly what we're checking here um, in this identity. This I, I kind of there's an s there's an extra s here. Um, so. This bit by itself, I didn't say that very well. This bit by itself has to be S inverse. Okay, so if you then if you match it up carefully, you, it will work. So this this equivalently this proves that the thing we wanted before, that the, that S strictly speaking S inverse has the right form. So S has the right form. Okay. Uh, now um, I have run out. I, I've, got, I've got ten minutes. I don't need to hurry. Sorry. Um, yeah. Given I don't have to hurry, um, I don't know if that was clear enough. I'm happy to say. It more slowly. Um, okay, sounds like it was all right. So, so now, um, so we've got this general construction. Now I'm going to apply it to 
to the example of BSL2. And um, so what's going on here? So UQSL2 is the quantum group I showed you. It has a braided version, which I call BQSL2 by transmutation. What does it look like? Well, it's a pretty horrible beast, but, there's a, but we use this isomorphism. So on the other side, we've got CQSL2. This is a co-quasi triangular hot algebra by the dual version of the transmutation construction using the category of co-modules, we will get a, a braided Hopf algebra, which I call BQ capital SL2. And then in the factorizable case, and I said I would tell you what that means, um, these are actually isomorphic. Um, so now what does factorizable mean? It means that this element Q, so now R lives in H tensor H, R21 is just R with the legs flipped and then multiplied in H tensor H. So, that, so Q lives in H tensor H. If I regard Q as a, as a map from H star into H by evaluating against one of its legs, I've forgotten which one, um, we require that to be an isomorphism. So that's what means factorizable. So this is called a quantum killing form. For an ordinary killing form, the killing, ordinary Lie algebra, the killing form is an isomorph a linear isomorphism between G star and G, right, for a semi-simple um, Lie algebra. So this is the analog. So the fact that this works for all UQG is the analog of is a is a is a is a remnant of the semi-simplicity of the original Lie algebra, um, and it corresponds to this quantum killing form being non-degenerate in that sense. So that's factorizable. So now we use that map to map. Now this this guy was built on the same algebra as as H. This guy, um, uh, so therefore the lambda, the capital lambda, the integral element in, in UQSL2 automatically gives us the integral element in B because on this side, because it's the same algebra. Now on this side, this, this uh, dual transition construction has the same co-algebra as CQSL2. So the Haar integral of CQSL2, it also becomes the Haar integral, uh, the braided Haar integral of this guy because it only uh, knows about its, it only needs to know about its co-algebra. Um, and therefore, and then in the factorizable case, this guy is isomorphic to this guy, so we can transfer over the integral obtained from the Haar integral on this side back to the integral obtained on this side. This is what I had gone through fairly quickly in the proposition. So now the quantum killing form in, what does it all come down to in practice? Well, this guy is generated by a matrix of generators, A, B, C, D, forming the relations of a Q, Q two by two Q matrix. I don't know if you've seen that anywhere. So the braided version is similar. It has generators alpha, beta, gamma, delta forming sort of being some Q commutation relations between them. And then it has a matrix type of coproduct. So the coproduct here, delta of this matrix, it has a matrix form. It's this matrix tensor itself. Um, so the coproduct on this side, easy to describe. On this side, it's very hard to describe. Um, the, this isomorphism by the quantum killing form, it actually maps them over like this. Um, where this guy has the same algebra as UQSL2. Now the integral, as I said, is we take, we follow that procedure that I told you, I've spelled it out here for n equals three. This is the braided integral. I put another line to remind you that it's braided um, on, on BQSL2. This is what you obtain. And it's different from the, from the previous one. It has a different flavor. It has support in the, uh, in the top degree, but here delta I, here I is two. It's, it's top minus one instead of, I being one. The, um, the co-products are obtained by the isomorphism. They look like this, or they're obtained by the formula I showed you using that formula for R. Um, I mean, if you try to go back to original formula, you would have to use this formula for the quasi-triangular structure. Um, should I have done that? Uh, maybe I shouldn't have. Um, you would have to go back to this formula for the quasi-triangular structure. Which is, which is extremely complicated. It involves these Q uh, factorials, which are factorials of these Q integers. Okay, so uh, whereas using this isomorphism um, is actually manageable. Okay, so you obtain the coproducts. Now, because they are part of a category, they don't behave multiplicatively. For example, if you want to write this in terms of the coproduct of K and the coproduct of F, you will have to have braiding between K and F. The braiding psi here, some examples of the braiding. See, some of them are trivial. Some of them have a factor Q. Some of them are more complicated. They have two terms. Um, okay. And they, they get very complicated uh, when you look at, uh, at general elements. Now, the, um, the integral element I told you was the same. It's the lambda I wrote down before. It's basically, um, it's, but now you apply the coproduct to it. This is the, U, the UQSL2 coproduct, not the braided one. 
Now we take that, we have to, we have to convert it to the braided co-product. So, so we have to work this out, there are 27 terms. You've got to apply the braided co-product. So the braided version of the co-product involves, involves applying the R. And you've got to use the braided version of the antipode. This is the braided version of the construction of that corollary uh, on, for, to get G. The other side's a bit easier. We just multiply in the braided hop algebra and we apply the integral. But this integral is different. The product is the same as for UQSL2. So it's a different bilingual, different Frobenius form. Um, and, and similarly, you, and so, you, so, so the whole theory works. And in the paper, I just pick, I prove, I, I check the snake identity on one generator on F just to do the entire calculation, just to check all my conventions that I didn't make any mistake. Um, okay, the, um, now, um, the, what, what, I also said that B of H is self-dual because there's a factorizable Hopf algebra. The, the inverse of theta, um, it turns out to be this, this element Q, basically. I apply the antipode to it. So that's the Hadamard structure of type two. Now, what that means is, is that when you trace through the definition, this H inverse, uh, it, becomes, it becomes integral, this, this using the braided integral against Q. But that was essentially what Lubashenko and I did many years ago. We call that the braided Fourier transform. So there is, if you take the, the canonical Fourier transform from B to B star and then compose it with the self-duality pairing of B star with B, then that gives you a map from B to B, and we call that the braided Fourier transform. And that's exactly what H, H inverse is, is giving you. So the Hadamard gate is a previously known thing, which is the braided Fourier transform. Now this braided Fourier transform plays, obeys the mapping uh, class group identity for PSL2Z. So that's this identity here for, for some constant lambda. Um, here tor is, uh, T is multiplication by the ribbon element. So this is also ribbon Hopf algebra. Now, uh, I, I, have, I, I really have run out of time this time. So um, I'll just say that the, this is relevant to the uh, construction of three manifold invariants by surgery. So what, you take a knot, you delete in, in, in S3, you delete, um, delete a thickening of the knot, that's a tube, and then you identify the tube with the standard torus by, um, by um, uh, and, and that is implemented by this element of the, element of the snapping class group, PSL2Z. And then you get a three manifold, and then three manif and that's and so that's how you that's how the knot invariants become three manifold invariants, um, which is the Turovari invariant. Now this should be related. Turovari invariant is basically what Kitayev is doing in the Kitayev model for topological quantum computing. Um, so there, the three manifold is of the form sigma cross R, but sigma is a ribbon. So this thing should relate up to it. But that's all I know so far. Okay, so it's just so I've run out of time. This is just a summary page. So, um, so just take a little pause from it, and then we'll just read out the summary. So, the um, what did we do? Firstly, we took the ZX calculus. So, in the original Dun uh, Duncan uh, Duncan uh, Coco paper, um, the relevant thing was the group algebra of Z two, and that's what people normally use for the standard realization of ZX calculus. Uh, but you can replace H by any Hopf algebra. And um, we sort of reviewed that. That was something that was recently done in, by Collins and Duncan. We reviewed it in a, in a, in a, in a, in a slightly fresh way um, and identified the other Hopf algebra in the pair is actually H star opposite. Uh, I don't, in principle, uh, you could have an F Hopf algebra which is not of this type. I just gave you a construction. It, possible there could be other F Hopf algebras. Um, I gave you the example of SL2. It, that's, that one is quite special with factor zero. If you want to have to actually be special, then you can take, for example, something like the quantum double that, of, of a, a finite group. Um, the Hadamard type two self was, was a sort of self-duality, which I think is more workable. I showed everything works in the braided case. I showed you the transmutation related to the TQFT. This last point suggests that D of H surface code, which is the Kataya model, should be related to ZX or could be related to ZX model. And this is exactly what Alex uh, Cowton talked about in his seminar a few weeks back. So it's something I've been uh, discussing with Alex over the last month. Um, the other thing which, is, which I haven't done, which is in the paper, but not in the talk, is we need something like star structures for unitarity because these gates are meant to be unitary uh, if they're really gonna be an actual quantum computer. And it turns out that in the braided case, in, even in the quantum case for, for quantum groups like this, which are not semi-simple, um, the star structure has certain complications, um, which are discussed in the paper. 
Um, so that's all I'm going to say about it here. But in the braided case, there's a limited, very limited window on braided star operations. Uh, but that's even more complicated. So I think that's a really uh, big mystery there. Okay, so I'm going to stop. I have finished with my time as well. Let's thank the speaker. Are there any questions? Uh, I have a question that uh, about like uh, in, in your paper, you cite this uh, this interacting Hopf algebras uh, paper, which is like a source of Hopf for Venus algebras in particular, given yep. uh, any like field, uh, the category of matrices is like a, a Hopf algebra with the, where the field elements are like uh, endomorphisms. And then if you look at the relations over matrices, then you get like the Hopf for Venus algebras. Um, is that, is that really true? Um, that's, I mean, sorry, are, are you talking, I think they're sort of, they're not actually hot algebras, but maybe hot um, in, a, in a quasi sense. I mean. Uh, no, well, I mean, uh, if you look at the relations then all of the scalars are like, uh, uh -huh. are, the, are the identity. I, I think, um, okay, you, 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 I think maybe you'll have to explain to me afterward. You, are, you, are you talking about this paper or are you talking about this paper, this first paper? Uh, no, no, I mean, in, in, in your paper, uh, I don't discuss anything other than over a field, um, but with the construction could work more generally, but I'm not quite sure what the more general, do you want to do things over a ring or? or uh, the, uh, my question is more like, I mean, this is just like one source of examples. So, I mean, I was just wondering if you've, if you've read it and if you like, if there's some like sort of braided version of like, like so-called like linear relations, which is like one source of examples. But I mean, this is just like, a, so, well, so I think that's so. Basically, the short answer is no, I haven't. Uh, but I think it's a very interesting question. I'm. I just need to get my mind behind exactly what you're, what you're, uh, which what you're referring to. So maybe we can just do it offline. I don't. I think okay. maybe it may take too long to discuss right now. But I, I would. I would say that there is a whole kind of quantum linear algebra. There's a whole theory of quantum planes and kind of quantum Cayley Hamilton theorem and this kind of stuff. So there may well be a Q version, a rated version of of what you're suggesting, um, if, if, that, if I understood your question correctly. But I, I certainly haven't looked at exactly what you've asked. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a question. Yeah. So in the regular ZX calculus, the Hadamard is, of course, self-inverse. So applying a Hadamard twice gives you identity. Yeah. And if, I, if I'm not mistaken, and Harney can probably correct me if I'm wrong, in general, Q did ZX calculus. If you apply a Hadamard four times, you get the identity. Um, is there any hope that something like this could be proven in your abstract setting? That like doing it four times gives you identity? Well, uh, that that sounds like a theorem that for every finite dimensional Hopf algebra, the, the fourth power of the antipode is the identity. So, um, but I um, I. I um, Maybe you can just explain exactly what your what result you're referring to. But in Hopf algebra theory, um, that's that's a result of Swedler and Larson. The s to the four is is the identity. Now, what happens with the standard Fourier transform is if you apply it twice, you get you get s. So therefore, if you apply f eight times, <laughs> you will get the identity. Um, that that, that it, uh, I, I suspect it's something 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 along those lines, but. Yeah, so in, in QDIT ZX, if you apply Hadamard twice, you get the antipode, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Yeah, and, and the antipode is minus one in like QDIT ZX, so that's so minus one yeah. squared. So, so I, th I, believe, I believe what you're saying here is, is that if you take the Z, if you take the Z2 Fourier transform, you apply it twice, you, uh, in fact, if you apply any of these Fourier trans, you apply it twice, you'll get the antipode. That, that's true. And then, and then if you apply apply the, um, maybe it, it, it reduces in, in, in the case you're considering, but in general, any hot powder, you have to apply it four times the antipode to get the identity. So I believe it will be at eight, would be the answer. So, something like that. Um, but I, I should say that the information here is, it depends very much on what you call the Hadamard gate. And in this, in this, in this one here, um, this is just Fourier transform. So here, if you apply it, uh, apply it once, Twice you'll get you'll get the inversion on the group, um, and uh, and so that's uh, right. And if you apply it, um, yeah, you have to apply n times. You have to you'd have to apply it 
you, so I think you get order two to the n, two n on this, in this example. You know, if the antipode is a uh, is like its own inverse when the Hopf algebra is like commutative and co-commutative. Yeah, that's that's also true. Yeah, so that's probably the that's probably. Oh, the, oh yes, 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 yes. Of course, I'm being stupid. Thank you. So yeah, so that's right. Uh, thank you. I think Cole's answered the question very well. So yeah, so what happens is that the square of the Fourier transform is is always the antipode, uh, in in some generality, and then the square of the antipode is one in the commutative case or co-commutative case. Um, so that's order four. But if for a general hot founder, but you have to go to you have to it's it's set of the four is identity. So that would be order eight. That's okay, that, that, that's nice. That's okay. Very neat. Um, if nobody else has questions, I have, I have, I have another question, um, a bit, uh, bit more vague. Um, so if I think about regular ZX uh, with the Hadamard and no phases, uh, so basically real stabilizers, mm -hmm. um, like if you, if you take the appropriate rule set, then this is complete for the fragment of the real stabilizers. And probably Cole can tell me like which spans or co-spans it's complete for. Um, but so I'm I'm wondering like because you have these other examples of these um, these like uh, uh, quantum SL2 kind yeah. of three-dimensional things. Yeah. Like, is there a graphical calculus for those things that is complete? Like, can I can I uh, add some additional uh, diagrammatic axioms? Mm -hmm. to fully capture these specific examples of Hopf algebras? Well, so if I understand correctly, what you want to know is whether you can generate all unitaries by composition of, of these structure maps from the, of the product, the co-product, the Hadamard gate, and maybe one or two other structures. No, no, no. So, so th th that would be more um, universality. I'm talking about completeness. So you have these three generators, A, F, and K, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I would imagine that you have, like, you, 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 you insert some additional states that allow you to represent these uh, the A, F, and K. And then you have some graphical axioms that capture the algebraic uh, relations between them. And then hopefully you get a complete graphical calculus. Is something like that possible or has been done? Well, I don't think it's been done, but surely you're just talking about a matrix representation of these algebras. And uh, what you want to know, yeah. Like, you want to know whether you can represent these algebras by matrices in a faithful way. Um, and, and, then, and, then, and then somehow express that diagrammatically, if I understand correctly. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Like, are, are these axioms like, um, the prop generated by these? Is this a, a faithful functor between this and? Yes, uh, I, I see. Um, um, well, you've always got the left, because these algebras are finite dimensional, you've always got the left regular representation. So they always act faithfully. And so you've always got, you hear, for example, when Q to the cubed is one, you'd have a 27 by 27 mm -hmm. matrix representing each of these of EF and K which would obey the relations, that would be the left regular representation. But I think, you know, you probably want something a lot smaller and then you probably want to check some properties of it. So if, if you're willing to tell me exactly what you're looking for, I can probably try to tell you. Um, but if you just want matrix representation, yes, of course they have matrix representations, but I think probably what you want is you want matrix representations which are compatible with something else. For example, unitarity, and the unitarity will be a problem. The matrices will not be unitary um uh in these cases but the case the case but this whole theory does apply to double of finite groups you take the double of s3 then everything that you could dream of will work nicely uh, because they're actually special they have a nice star structure everything works more easily so these are the guys which are more relevant to tqft and the turo variant variants but for kitaya model the double of s3 is also perfectly interesting and non-trivial so um i think it's like uh in the short term, um, I think you can find answers which where things will work better than these ones. These ones are going to have certain issues, but in in the in the long run, these are more exciting. Okay. So maybe like a question following up on like John, like do you see? Could you like envision any like sort of like braided ZX like uh, calculus that is like. I mean, because like the history of the ZX calculus is you had a bunch of generators and then people like found uh, sound axioms and then they like found, uh, they, they added like more generators and then and then they showed things were complete and then they showed that things were uh, universal so you could yeah. express anything. Like, do you see some sort of like potential research 
program? Yeah, uh, or yeah. yeah ab absolutely. I mean, absolutely. That was that's kind of the whole point. Um, why otherwise I probably wouldn't have wasted my time um, <laughs> trying to do this. But 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 you know, that's really for you guys. You know, you guys know much more about what you actually want than I do. So I'm very happy if someone wants to discuss with me, you know, exactly what you're looking for, and I'll try to help. Um, but yeah, um, that's the point. But the only thing I would warn you is is, is just to proceed slowly and with examples because um, I think the examples are quite tricky. And you know, I'd hope that something like the braided line, which is, a, which is generated with one generator, braided off algebra, but they don't, that I checked it is not Frobenius and co-Frobenius. The integral is not a morphism in the category. So if you wanted to apply this machinery, you've got to immediately generalize the whole notion of the Frobenius uh, uh, Hopf algebra to allow for the integral and the values, the valuation of the Frobenius form will not be in the unit field, a unit of the of the category, but will be in some non-trivial object of the category. Uh, and so, so for the simplest examples, you may need something like that. But in the short term, um, but the transition examples they do they they do work. But I'm not. I think the road to actually apply this in computer science is quite long. Um, but because we know that TQFT. Uh, if things like, uh, if I understand correctly, things like the um, Fibonacci anions, which are used in TQFT, uh, in in topological computing, they relate to UQ to the braided, well, probably to the braided version. But they certainly relate to UQSL2, at uh, I think a fifth root of unity. I think Alex and I, Counton and I, were talking about that. Um, have dug out some literature on that. So, so there, so the, there are it's what what so the current state of the art is. People have just tried to work directly with the modular tensor category that these guys generate. So if you just work in the modular tensor category, you can try to do your surface code theory, et cetera, and people talk about Fibonacci anions, et cetera. But to have an underlying ZX calculus type structure, um, which is what Alex talked about in his talk, um, you need you need a lot more than the MTC. You need to kind of have this ZX calculus model. So what I'm trying, what I'm proposing is that this kind of structure come in on this side and then based on the fact that the braided version it has has carries with it the mapping class group action it seems likely that the right object that we really want is not exactly uqsr2 but the braided version so that that's that's how, that's how i see it but I, it's all um conjectural so i think it's a very good question to try to answer this uh to to what kind of zx calculus do you want uh, and what kind of universality proper? So you could take, for example, you could take the you could take be very concrete. You could take D of S three as a as a as a factorizable quantity triangular hot algebra. You could take its transmuted version, or even just the quantum version, and you could then uh, and then you could just ask what does the ZX model associated with that with the Frobenius structures that I showed you? Um, does it have your completeness and universality properties? Um, with respect to, uh, your, you know, uh, in the way that you want, and that will be very concrete. So, I, I think there are there are quite concrete questions to ask there. Can Can I ask a follow up question? Yeah. Sure. Okay. So, uh, so then this form of ZX calculus would be like a representation of a lattice model, not a ZX calculus for quantum computation, right? Because then, like, so these these. Uh, Hof algebra of key type model are, are just a uh, operator of the lattice model, not exactly uh, the Hof yeah. algebra of anionic model, right? This, 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 is, this is true. So in the Kataya model, there's no discussion about ZX calculus. There's just, as you said, there's just uh, various states built on the lattice and excitations, which are these anions, quasi particles, et cetera. And, um, and, and, that, and the, there's a Hopf algebra H, which is the input data, but the actual symmetries, the, the, what plays the role of the isometry group of the quasi particle, the, the Poincare group, is the quantum double. Um, so that's, that, that's all the self contained theory, which is related to the Turing Vera invariant. Now, what Alex in his talk, which is kind of, I found very inspiring, uh, was he was explaining how there could be a functor from the surface. So if you put here H is Z2, then what you've got on this side is the standard surface code with the four, with the under tensor category of the four objects that Alex talked about. And, uh, but what Alex explained was that there was some kind of connection between that and the standard ZX model on Z2, which is the standard ZX, ZX realization. And so, um, so if that can be extended, which, you know, nobody knows, um, then, then, then that could establish a link. So that, so it's not, so it could be related in, in some generality. 
Okay. So, so the on, so the answer uh, the answer is they are they are not independent if if they should be z two, but that relationship is not well understood. D did I misunderstand your question? Maybe. And uh, no, that answered my question. Thank you. Are there any more questions? Uh, in that case, let's thank uh, Sean again. Okay, thank you very much. You're a great audience.